next uh, guests on the program, Matt Thistlethwaite from the Labor Party, Tony Passon from the Liberal Party. Gentlemen, thanks both for your time. Okay, Tom. Pleasure. Uh, you were watching on, I'm sure, as uh, the Nationals were going about things again and we've had some very outspoken Nationals MPs since. One thing seems pretty clear, the insurgents and Barnaby Joyce are not going to stop, are they? Well, um, I hope they do, Tom, because it's important that we're unified. What we saw uh, yesterday, unfortunately, was an, op uh, an opportunity that was cultivated effectively by the Labor Party, led by Anthony Albanese, who tells us the nation is experiencing conflict fatigue. But what we saw yesterday in the House of Representatives is a very obvious um, opportunity that was taken to agitate uh, those tensions. And uh, I think it's disappointing. I, I, for one, am someone who subscribes to the conventions of this place. Uh, and I think over a decade we've trashed them. And we shouldn't. And we wonder then why perhaps the people of Australia, the citizenry, uh, have a lower and lower regard for class politics. And I think you saw it on display yesterday, and it was principally driven remembering that that nomination came uh, from Labor. Matt Pistlethwaite, was it Labor who was drumming up the discontent in the Nats? It was your strategy, wasn't it, to put them forward? So surely you were briefing the Nats beforehand? Certainly not. I mean, it's a, it's a long stretch to try and blame the Labor Party for the disarray that's going on well, in nominated. the coalition you at, at the moment. <laughs> well, well, Lou O'Brien proclaimed yesterday to be uh, leaving the National Party, uh, so someone that was further independent. We'd supported an independent person in Kevin Hogan for the Deputy Speaker's position in the past. We did the same yesterday. But it's not our fault that this government can't get its act together, can't govern properly, and we all know if you can't govern yourselves, you can't govern the nation. And we've seen that over the course of the summer with the devastating bushfires and how ill-prepared this government was for that, despite the fact that we'd had warnings for over a decade. We've seen it with economic management and the fact that the RBA has been calling for some months now for the government to take seriously the downturn in investment, the low wages growth and other issues. It's a government in disarray and that was represented yesterday by what happened on Look, the floor of the parliament. You won the day, you won the tactics, you got the story up there, but surely you can put up your hand and you don't expect voters to believe that Labor just had a burning desire to get the talent of Lou O'Brien and his deputy speaker. We know what this was about. Well, I certainly didn't speak to anyone from the National Party or the government prior to that vote occurring. Um, but, but and why, why did you vote for Lou O'Brien? Because uh, he proclaimed yesterday in the morning that he was moving out of the National Party and that he would be a rather independent member um, and sit um, without the National Party. Now, as I said earlier, I'd supported Kevin Hogan when he'd done a similar thing because, in my view, it's probably better to have a, a more an independent speaker um, well, because speaker, you get it's not the speaker. Well, he doesn't really call any. Of nonetheless, that. those positions in the parliament matter um, to me, Tom, and I think it's probably better to have a rather independent person in that position because you're going to get a fairer deal. So, that, apart from that, you don't think he has any special skills that would have made him good for the job? Look, uh, I, don't, I haven't had too much to do with Lou. I've met him on a couple of occasions, had a few conversations with him. He's certainly got a distinguished career as a police, police officer and I thought he was worthwhile of being nominated. Uh, he accepted the nomination um, and again, I think it represents the disarray that the government's in at the moment. What do you think of the Nationals MPs that supported this pitch? We've gone through the games over there, happy to call that what it is, but it wouldn't have happened without Nationals MPs defying what the coalition government wanted. Tom, it's not what I think of them. Um, individually, people have to account to their own constituencies and, um, and, at, and their teams. But, you know, from my perspective, I think it's important we focus on the challenges this nation is facing right now as a government, whether it be bushfires, uh, floods, the drought, uh, the coronavirus. I mean, uh, the reality here is these are games that are played in Canberra inside the bubble, and I've got to tell you, they don't penetrate uh, out in my electorate. What, in my electorate, what my constituents are looking for is local and practical solutions to the challenges they're facing, uh, be it drought or fire. But you can't deny it seems to take away the focus on that when, I mean, you have a leadership spell for the Nats on the day we're supposed to be having remembrance for bushfire victims. We had this sideshow yesterday when they could have been focusing on policy. We don't really have anything put forward yesterday that anyone noticed apart from the Nationals debacle. So is that not the issue that you should be explaining to constituents? But Annalise, the point about this is from um, Labor Party's perspective had an opportunity to end the conflict yesterday and instead of ending that conflict and observing the convention, what we saw was an opportunity to inflame that, take advantage of the idiosyncratic circumstances that are present in this building uh, at, at this point. And, you know, this comes from a party that are pretty keen to tell us they aren't uh, seeking to politicise bushfires or drought or these things and yet every time there seems to be 
uh, an opportunity, the Leader of the Opposition is out uh, with a camera uh, talking about these things, seeking to inflame situations. What I'd love to see, and I know what my constituents would love to see, is us coming together, putting hands across the divide right now and focusing on the very serious threats, whether it's a virus, whether it's drought, flood or fire. These are real and present concerns for the Australian people and we should be working together to solve that, not playing silly games in Canberra. Big debate about coal at the moment. The coal-fired power station, the, the possible Healy one in North Queensland, will have this $4 million feasibility study. Will you look at the results of that and whatever it decides, feasible or otherwise, say fair enough, play on? I think that's exactly right, Tom. What we need to do is look deeply at this proposal, see if it stacks up. That's what this has been about. Others have sought to turn this debate into something other than what it is, namely um, a discussion and an investigation about the feasibility of this particular technology in this particular place. Um, my view is um, uh, that I'm looking very much forward to the outcome of this report. I note there have been two previous reports commissioned by Labor that uh, indicate um, viability of this Quite particular Quite a while facility. ago, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's why there's a need to, to check in, double check, and uh, I'm looking forward to the outcome. Matt, the discussion has been from Labor that shouldn't be putting that $4 million of taxpayer money into this feasibility study, but what do you make of Matt Canavan's comments this morning that you're more than welcome to get up there and rail against it at Labor's own peril? Well, I don't believe that we should be investing taxpayers' dollars in a feasibility study for something that is becoming an outdated technology. Uh, Governments shouldn't be encouraging coal-fired power stations. They should be encouraging the uptake of renewable energy for a number of reasons. Firstly, coal-fired power um, is one of the highest polluting sources of carbon that there is in terms of energy sources. We need to, if we're going to meet our Paris commitments, if we're going to deliver a cleaner environment for our kids, transition away from coal-fired power. The second reason is it doesn't stack up economically, and that's because uh, over time what we're seeing is the cost of renewables coming down. There's a big lumpy investments that take a lot of time to come on. In 10 years time, it's quite likely that the cost of renewables is going to be cheaper than coal-fired power. So it doesn't stack up economically uh, and it shouldn't be the case that the government's putting money into something that's not going to get up. Are you finding this at your own peril though? Queensland lost Labor the election really and it was taking a huge hit from railing against coal there. Is this not something you should be considering supporting just for that reason? Well, we're actually in the business of trying to support people working in these industries. At the last election, uh, Labor was the only party that had a policy about a just transition for people working in coal-fired power. Now, we're starting to see coal-fired power stations uh, come to the end of their useful life uh, and be retired. What's the government's approach to support those workers in those industries as those coal-fired power stations reach their retirement age? They don't have one. We're being open and honest with the Australian public and saying that as they reach their uh, useful lifespan, what's the plan to ensure that these people have jobs into the future? We're all about jobs in this sector the, and protecting well, the transition them. plan, but that wasn't necessarily fleshed out, fleshed out, was it? That was a, you spoke about a transition plan. Did you identify set coal-fired power stations when they'd retire, what those workers were going to do? Well, we know that there are lifespans for these coal-fired power stations. Some of them in Victoria have, have started to retire already um, and a lot of those workers uh, haven't had just transitions in place to help them. It was highlighted on one of the programs on the ABC last night about a worker uh, who worked in that industry asking go the government, what's the plan for me when my coal-fired power job is no longer there? These are right. legitimate questions that workers in these industries should have a plan from the government for. Just wanted to ask finally, we're nearly out of time, about Blaze Aid. I know something you've been involved with, Tony Passon. Um, this is a bit of a, an un, not unspoken about, but little spoken about crisis to do with the bushfires. We're running out of fence posts to put back in. What's happening here? Well, we are, Tom. We came into this fire season with uh, up to 12 months in terms of wait lists for serious orders for fence posts. Before the fires. Before the fires. The fires, on best estimates, are going to need uh, roughly 52 million fence posts. Um, uh, it's uh, approximately five years' worth of production, a uh, million cubic tonnes. We do about 200 thousand cubic tonnes a year. Um, it's an issue that the industry is aware of. It, the industry, governments, communities will need to rise to this challenge because I know, speaking to farmers, that once they get over the shock of the fire, once they deal with the immediate issues, the first priority is to fence their property and if you don't have fence posts that becomes a real issue. I think this is a bipartisan issue. This is one of the sad circumstances of, of the fires and if we're going to help these important industries, agricultural industries and rural and regional communities rebuild, then we need to get on. And that's, you know, all part of developing a plan to deal with these issues into the future.
There we go. We found one issue we can reach across the divide on. Matt Thistlefight, Tony Fasson, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks.